Well, it's a real, real pleasure to be here, and I'm very thankful to Tina for the opportunity and for all you friends here. And uh, as Tina was mentioning, my, my passion is peace. You know, I'm, I was trained as an anthropologist. I practice as a mediator, but my real passion is helping people get to yes, helping people, organizations, societies get to yes. I really believe that's the, the maybe the, the biggest challenge that we face today on this planet. Uh, as an anthropologist, if I was, uh, say, living a thousand years from now and I look back at this era and I would wonder what to call it, I think I, thanks to language, thanks to the communication revolution that makes this possible, we're all 16,000 language groups around the world are for the first time in our evolution as a species in touch with each other. We know each other exists. We're living in an era that future anthropologists might call the era of the human family reunion. And like many family reunions, it's not all peaceful. Uh, you know, there's emotions, there's inequities, there's injustices. And the big question that I think faces us all, whether it's in our microcosm of our relationships immediately around us or as a whole, is how do we get along with each other? How do we deal with our deepest differences? How do we get to yes? If I think about it, for example, in negotiation, which I define very simply and very broadly as simply the act of back and forth communication, you're trying to reach agreement with someone else. You have some interests which you hold in common, like perhaps an ongoing relationship. You have other interests which are intention, like perhaps you like to sell your services for slightly more, they like to pay slightly less. How do you reach agreement in those circumstances? I've had the privilege of over the last three or four decades of having a front seat on a revolution that we're not even that aware that's happening around the world that accompanies the knowledge revolution, accompanies the communication revolution. It's a revolution in the way in which we as individuals or as organizations or as societies make decisions. Because traditionally, a generation ago, the main way was the people who sit on the top of the pyramids of power, they give the orders and the people on the bottom follow them. But now, thanks to the internet, thanks to the information revolution, those pyramids of power are slowly beginning to collapse into organizations that most of us live in, which are more like networks, networks of negotiation. Let me just illustrate this for a moment with you right here and just ask you a few questions. If you think about who you negotiate with in the broadest sense of that term, just back and forth communication, who do you find yourself negotiating with in the course of your day? Just to see the variety here in the room, if you don't mind shouting it out. Your son, okay, right there. Your, your children, it starts right there. Who else do you negotiate with? Clients, your husband, staff, colleagues, yourself. So if you were just to make a ballpark estimate of how much of your time in the course of your day you spend engaged in the act of back and forth communication, trying to reach agreement on some issue, however small, with your children, your staff, your spouse, your partner, your employees, your, your boss, whatever. Commuters. Commuters. How much of your time do you think you spend it is? 70%, 80%. How many of you say it's at least half my time I spend, okay? So, you know, almost all the hands go up. Now, if you think about, say, the last 10 years of your life, you know, you may be risen up in an organization, you have a little more power, a little more authority. Would you say the amount of time that you negotiate has stayed pretty much the same over the last 10 years? Has it gone down over time or has it gone up? How many of you say it's gone up? See all those hands? That's the negotiation revolution. And it's taking place in every one of those 131 cities that Tina just mentioned. It's taking place around the world. It's a global revolution. This is... This, we're, and this is where I think it calls for the creative community because we're having to invent new ways of making decisions together across all kinds of boundaries, cultural boundaries, national boundaries, never before. And so we're the first generation that has to reinvent what it means to negotiate, to reach agreement with others. Now, if you think about it for a moment, uh, in fact, I think it, it's, it's useful if you have in mind, I'm going to go through a little, bit of a, a little bit of a framework, a little bit of a journey around negotiation. And if you have in mind at least one situation that you want to just think about in the course of the next hour, I'm hoping that maybe by the end of the hour you'll get a fresh idea or two about how to approach that negotiation with your son or daughter or spouse or partner or, or, or colleague. It's 
at work. But if, you, if we think about it for a moment, different approaches that we can take to negotiation, uh, depending on how much emphasis you put on trying to meet your interests, how much concern you show for your interests, and how much concern you show for the other side, for the other side's interests. And effectively, this gives you four approaches from low to high. Essentially, we could, for example, just pay intense concern to our own interests, try to get what we want, no, no, no regard for the other, and you get this rather hard adversarial approach. Or you could do the converse, which is just you know, pay attention to the client, the customer, they're always right, or whatever it is, give them everything they want, but not pay attention to our own interests, and you get this rather soft, accommodating approach. And we can think about what kind of approaches we tend to use. Oftentimes, inside organizations, inside families, uh, there's a lot, because conflict is something, when there's conflict, we get uncomfortable with it, we tend to avoid. And so oftentimes we use this approach of, we avoid, we don't talk about it, it's too difficult, and so we're not showing concern for our interests and we're not showing concern for the other side's interests. Now the challenging thing, I think the best approach is to look for an approach where you do both, where you simultaneously show concern for your own interests and concern for the other side's interests. A mutual gains approach, looking for something that can satisfy both sides. And that comes back to you because I think that takes a lot of creativity. And that's perhaps our biggest resource in negotiation. We often kind of get uncomfortable around negotiation, but if you think of it as a creative challenge, I think you can see it as, a, as an opportunity. Because we often approach negotiation like there's a fixed pie. And whatever share of the pie I get, the other side doesn't get. Whatever they get, I don't get. But in fact, the real opportunity exists is to expand that pie before you divide it up. And that takes the creative thinking. So if you want to think about it, the, the key, the core, the core principle underlying creative negotiation is the ability to focus on interests rather than positions. We tend to focus in negotiation, if you think about it, we tend to focus on concrete demands or stances. I want this at a certain price. You know, it's, it's numbers, it's, it's particular things. But the key in negotiation is to always ask yourself the question, why? Starting with why, where's uh, Simon here? But anyway, is to ask your, your, the, the question, why? Why do you want that? What's, what's behind the position? What are the underlying interests? In other words, what are the underlying motivations or needs or desires or fears that lie behind it? You know, a, a kind of a classic story is story of, you know, two sisters who were quarreling about an orange and they were quarreling about the orange for a long time and finally they just took a knife and cut the orange in half. One sister took her half, you know, peeled it and ate the fruit. The other sister took her half, peeled it, threw away the fruit and used the half appeal for baking a cake. In other words, that's often how we negotiate. We, we, we leave, we take half appeal and half a fruit when if we had looked behind the position, which is that single orange, and asked the question, why do we want that orange, whether it's to eat or to cook, we might each end up with a whole peel and a whole fruit. And that's the real opportunity in negotiation by probing behind positions for underlying interests. Now, it's not so easy in today's world to keep focusing on our underlying interests because there are so many distractions right now from cell phones to texts to uh, distracting emotions in conflict. It's very easy to lose sight of that. So the question is, how do we keep sight of our interests? And the biggest obstacle I find, interestingly, in, the, in all the years I've been working in, in negotiation, actually, is we think the biggest obstacle to us getting what we want is the other side. They're difficult. And certainly they can be difficult. But what I've discovered is that actually the single biggest obstacle to us getting what we really need and want in life is right here. It's ourselves. It's in our very natural human tendency to react. As Ambrose Bierce once put it, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that happens more often than not. We have this tendency to react, to act without thinking. And the truth is that you know, negotiation is about influence. We're trying to change someone else's mind. How can we possibly 
expect to influence someone else if we can't first influence ourselves. So it all begins right here with ourselves, with self-mastery, with the ability to get to yes with ourselves first in order then to be able to get to yes with others. And one way, I, one metaphor I like to use is this metaphor of going to the balcony. It's almost like when you're negotiating with someone, be it a, a family member or be it at work, it's almost like you're negotiating up here on a stage. You're an actor on a stage and part of you goes to a mental and emotional balcony overlooking that stage, which is a place of perspective, a place of calm, a place of self-control, a place where you can keep your eyes on the prize, because that's the hardest thing. You know, so often in life now, nowadays, there's, you know, things come in, you get an email from a colleague that uh, upsets you, you were left out of a decision. And the most tempting thing is to look on that screen and hit the reply, but you know, compose a reply and hit reply, you get that instant satisfaction. Or what's even worse is we hit the reply all button, and then it goes out to the entire organization, all of our colleagues, and then you start to see conflict start to escalate. There is a button on that screen that is very rarely used uh, that I think of as the balcony button. It's called the save as draft. And that's the one where you compose the reply, you hit save as a draft, and then all of us have our favorite ways of going to the balcony. It might be... Uh, it might be going for a walk around the block, it might be going a cup of coffee with a friend, taking a night to sleep on it, going for a workout, to go back to a place of calm and perspective so that when we then come back, we can ask the key question, is this reply going to advance my interests? Is this gonna solve the problem or not? And you, most likely you're gonna hit the delete button and then you're gonna pick up the phone, call the person, try to get together with them or at least talk with them so that you can try and arrange it. It's very hard to do that by email. Email lends itself to all kinds of misreading, miscommunication, because it doesn't communicate tone or context or emotion that you can use to try and solve any kind of sensitive situation. If I just think about a, my, one, of, one of my great lessons of going to the balcony, uh, some years ago, I was working in the country of Venezuela. Uh, I was asked by the UN to go there, and it, it was a time, as today, actually, when there were you know, a million people on the streets demanding the downfall of the president, who was then President Hugo Chavez, and there were a million people on the streets uh, you know, wanting him to stay in power. It was very polarized. And, uh, and I went there, and at one point, I, I had a meeting with President Chavez. It was appointed for 9 o'clock at night in the presidential palace, I waited there very patiently with my colleague, Francisco Diaz, and 9.30, 10, 10.30, 11, 11.30. Finally, at midnight, I'm ushered in to see the president, expecting to find him alone, but in fact, he's got his entire cabinet arrayed behind him. And uh, he says, oh, oh, so, Bill, here, I have a seat here. Tell me, uh, uh, how do, what do you, what's your impression of what's going on here in Venezuela? And I said, uh, well, Mr. President, I've been talking to some of your ministers here. I've been talking to the leaders of the opposition. And it seems to me there's a little bit of progress. As soon as he heard the word progress, he lost it. He said, what do you mean progress? You must be foolish. You're naive. You're not seeing the dirty tricks those traitors on the other side are up to. And he leaned in very close to my face and he proceeded to shout for approximately 30 minutes. So... You know, here I am, and I'm thinking, I'm not naive, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of what, what I could say back to him, feeling like all this work I'd been doing in Venezuela over the last previous year and a half was going down the drain, feeling a little bit embarrassed, whatever. But, you know, that's all going on in, in any kind of negotiation for us, in any kind of tense situation. But then I remembered a friend of mine who had said, you know, Bill, if you're ever in a tough situation, pinch the palm of your hand. And I said to him, why would I do that? He said, well, because that will give you a momentary pain and will keep you alert. So for whatever reason, <laughs> I remembered to do that at that particular moment. And I was pinching the palm of my hand and going to the balcony and asking myself the key question, what's my key interest here? What's the prize? Is it really to get into an argument with the president of Venezuela? Is that gonna, is that gonna advance things? So I bit my tongue and I just listened and I just listened to him. And he was well known for being able to go on for eight hour speeches. But after half an hour of just me just patiently listening, nodding my head, whatever, he kind of he ran out of steam a little bit. And I saw just watching his body language, his, 
his shoulders began to sink. And so he said to me in a slightly weary tone of voice, he said, so Yuri, what should I do? <laughs> that is the sound of a human mind opening. The very faint sound. And, uh, but because if, if before that, when someone's angry with you, you know, if you try to just use reason, it's a little bit like banging your head against the wall. But that was an opening. And so I said to him, well, Mr. President, I think uh, it's, it's December, it's almost Christmas time. Last Christmas, all the festivities around the country were canceled because of this tension, the conflict. Uh, why not just declare a truce? You know, let the whole country go to the balcony, as it were. And then in three weeks' time, we can resume the conversation. He said, that's an excellent idea. I'm going to propose that in my next speech. His mood had completely shifted because I hadn't reacted. In fact, he said to me, you know, over Christmas, I'd like you to come travel the country with me. If you, you know, I think it would be good for you to get to know. Then he thought, wait a minute, you're a, you're a neutral, you're a mediator, maybe it wouldn't be so good for you to be seen in my company all the time. He said, but no problem, I'll give you a disguise. <laughs> <laughs> and what I learned from that was that maybe the greatest power we have in negotiation is the power not to react the power not to react, the power to go to the balcony and remember why we're there. That to me is like the foundation of successful negotiation. And why we're there on the balcony, knowing what our interests are, then something that automatically comes up, of course, is where are we going to have the power to be able to meet our interests? Where does power come from in negotiation? And I'm not talking about power over the other side. I'm talking about power to satisfy your interests, empowering power. Where does that come from? And one thing I've noticed is in negotiation, we tend to focus naturally on reaching an agreement. But actually, one of the most important questions to ask ourselves before any negotiation, when we're on the balcony for a moment, is to ask ourselves, how are we going to meet our interests if for some reason we are not able to reach agreement with that particular person at that particular time. That in negotiation is what we call your BATNA, which is an acronym standing for your best alternative to a negotiated agreement. It's almost like in any negotiation, there's a, there's a fork in the road. You can either go towards an agreement or you go towards your BATNA, which is your best course of action if you cannot reach agreement. So for example, imagine you're looking for a job and you have one job interview and that's all you've got. And you know you're gonna be talking about salary and if you think that's your only alternative, think about how the negotiation goes around salary, for example. But imagine you take the intervening time to think through what's your BATNA. What are you gonna do if you don't get that particular job? You look around, see if there are any other job offers. You think, well, maybe I'd be willing to maybe even move uh, or maybe go back to school or think about how you're gonna satisfy your interests if for some reason you don't get that job. If you have an alternative, then think about how the negotiation goes. You're gonna negotiate with more confidence because the key in negotiation is you wanna care about the issue, but not too much, as a friend of mine likes to say. Uh, not too much. That way you're not hostage of the other side. And that way you're going to negotiate with more confidence and a more sense of freedom, and you're more likely to reach a good agreement. So knowing your BATNA beforehand is just a useful thing. We don't often go there because we think that's kind of negative thinking, you know, but it actually it's alternative positive thinking. Realizing that you have options, you have alternatives, turns out to be key in negotiation. And then, then it comes to, okay, how do you... How do you deal with the person on the other side, the relationship? How do you deal with them? Uh, there's a natural tendency in negotiation uh, to, I'd say there are kind of two classic mistakes we make in negotiation. We, we, because the other person is really important to us, it's a family member, it's you know, a close customer, whatever, we tend to be, we want to be soft on the people and therefore, we end up being soft on the problem. We give them everything they need, but we don't actually solve our problem. Or sometimes we make the opposite mistake, which is we're hard on the problem because this problem needs to be solved. And in the process, we end up being hard on the person. What you find successful negotiators doing is the opposite. 
it's almost like they draw a line in their heads between the problem on the other, on the one hand, which needs to be solved, and the people on the other hand, which is the psychological, emotional, relational aspect of that problem. And so that they, they separate the people from the problem so that simultaneously they can be soft in dealing with the people as they are hard in dealing with the problem. In fact, the harder you need to deal with the problem, the softer you need to be on, in dealing with the people, the more respectful you need to be if the people, their emotions, their and so on, are not going to get in the way of dealing with that problem. And the key way to dealing with, to be soft on the person is a very simple one. It's the ability to listen. Uh, you know, we think about negotiation as talking. And we think about an effective negotiator as an effective talker. But actually, if you observe the behavior of successful negotiators, you find that they listen far more than they talk. Why is that? Because in negotiation, it's an exercise in influence. You're trying to change someone else's mind. How can we possibly change someone else's mind unless we know where their mind is? And how can we know where their mind is unless we listen? And so listening to me is kind of the lost skill. It's something in today's world where everything is so fast, we forget to listen. And yet listening may be the cheapest concession we can make in a negotiation. It's something that costs us nothing a little bit of time, but it means everything to the other side. It conveys respect. It gives us information about what they want. It helps us deal with the situation. So, and listening doesn't mean just listening so that you can make your point. It's not listening to refute. It means listening to, listening to understand. And it's listening not just within your frame of reference, which is how we normally listen, and we have this voice saying, I don't agree with this, I don't agree with that. It's listening from within the frame of reference of the other. It's putting yourself in their shoes. That's, to me, the kind of the key skill, fundamental skill in negotiation. So in addition to balcony, in addition to knowing your BATNA, this ability, the power of listening to me is one of the great powers in negotiation. Oftentimes, we negotiate in teams. You know, we'll appoint a spokesperson, someone who will speak for the team, but I think it's just as important to appoint a listener. It's a full-time job just to listen to the other side and paraphrase, see if you can paraphrase what comes back. So essentially, those three skills... Oh, let me just actually ask you this question here, just in terms of listening here. I mean, here's a kind of picture. You may have seen it before. What do you see in that picture? What do you see? What do you see? How many of you see a woman, just out of curiosity, a woman? How many of you see a man? And of the woman, how many of you see a, a young woman? How many of you see an older woman? Now, see, it's the same picture. This is like reality, the reality we're negotiating. But you can see there are very different ways of seeing that reality. Very different. Those of you who are seeing a woman, a young woman, it's kind of a profile like that, right? Those of you who are seeing an older woman, this might be her nose, her mouth, her chin. And those of you who are seeing the man, you're seeing, this is his nose, he's kind of wearing some kind of uh, scotch tartan, he's got a mustache. Essentially, you know, in, it, this is like, there's, this is the reality that we often face. There's one reality, but there are many ways to see it. And oftentimes what you find, the pattern is, we say, no, it's a woman. No, it's a man. It's, 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 the person's old. The person's young. We get into a big argument about the facts, but in fact, it's all about perceptions. It's all about where you stand, where, how, you see th how you see reality in very different ways. And so this is why listening turns out to be so key, because rather than just assert our definition of the facts, it doesn't mean that you surrender how you see the situation. But if you can put yourself in the other person's shoes and see the world the way they see it, there might be three ways of seeing the situation. There might be 10 ways of seeing that situation. And the only way we can try to get at that in this world is by listening to the other side. So, brings me back to you, to the creative community, because to me, the biggest opportunity in negotiation is to invent. It's to invent options for mutual gain. Uh, it's to invent before you evaluate. The single biggest block in negotiation is a little voice in the back of our heads that's always saying, that won't work. You know, you're at a meeting, you come up with a creative idea, someone else says, you're not serious, you never thought about that, that's a crazy idea. It kills off, there are these killer phrases you hear. What kind of killer phrases do you hear in your own meetings that kill off potentially creative ideas? 
That won't work. That's not in our budget. We can't do that. Off, off, off what? Off grant? <laughs> yeah, so in other words, it's very natural. So the, the key thing in negotiation, just like you separate the people from the problem, or you separate positions from interests, is to separate the process of inventing from the process of evaluating. It's a very important part of our brain that evaluates ideas, it judges, but best off to keep that separate from the part of our brain that's creative, that's imaginative. And so it's the whole secret of brainstorming is you invent first, you evaluate later. So, and brainstorming a wide range of options, leveraging differences, you know, going back to that orange story, it's precisely because those two sisters had differing interests one was interested in cooking, one was interested in eating, that they could have ended up with a whole peel for one and a whole fruit for the other. Oftentimes, what we mistake to be opposed interests are actually just differing but complementary interests behind it. And then brainstorming jointly as, as wizards. You know, uh, many years ago, my colleague Roger Fisher and I were visiting the arms control talks when in Geneva with, between the United States and the Soviets. And... We had lunch with them, and I was asking them, you know, it seems to me seven years, and they still haven't reached an agreement. What's going on? You know, seven years ago, there seemed to be other treaties. And they said, oh, yeah. I said, why is that? And they said, oh, yeah, the difference, many things. But one thing was back then, we had something we called the wizards. And I said, what were the wizards? And they said, the wizards were two Americans and two Russians who had four characteristics. They were technically knowledgeable about the subject, which happened to be arms control. They were bilingual in both languages. They were lower level than the ambassadors, and hence, as they joked, they were disposable. And these four would get together whenever there was a problem, an impasse in the talks, out on the lake there in Lake Geneva at a restaurant, and they would shoot the breeze. They would invent. They would be creative. And they would say, what if we were to count the warheads this way? It's a lot of what if kind of questions. They said that more breakthroughs came out of those wizard talks than out of any other source. And so that's the key, is where in your negotiations, if you're having a tough problem in your organization or so on, where are the wizards? Where are the people who might be slightly lower level than the top, who can kind of brainstorm? And that's what we need more and more in this world, is those kinds of wizards. And maybe you might be wizards, creative wizards. That's, that's what we need in negotiation. So let me just end for a moment before taking some questions, but let me just give you one challenge before we, we end, just to kind of sum this up. What I'd like you to do is turn to the person next to you and get into arm wrestling position, if you wouldn't mind. Arm wrestling. Okay, ready? So, you know, as, as in negotiation, you know, you, you, you want, you want, let's say, imagine you want to, as in arm wrestling, you want to win, right? You, you maximize your number of points, right? Let's imagine that every time you get the other person's arm down, as in arm wrestling, you get a thousand points, okay? Get ready, get set, go. Now, what I'm seeing here, what I'm seeing here is a little bit of a learning process. Because a lot of us start off, you know, arm wrestle, zero, zero. I see a lot of kind of standoffs, which often what happens in negotiation, kind of a standoff like that, right? Maybe if you're super strong, you get the other person's arm down once, but then it was like a light bulb went on for a number of people and said, wait a minute, I want to maximize my number of points. I'm going to relax my arm, a thousand for you, a thousand for me, a thousand for you, a thousand for me. And I think so, you got a hundred thousand points, right? <laughs> so to me, what that illustrates is the essence of successful negotiation, which is we so often in negotiation, we approach it like it's an arm wrestle. Who's going to win? You know, who's going to win this situation? But in fact, the greatest power that we have as negotiators is the power to change the game. It's to change the game from an arm wrestle where one side wins and the other side loses to a cooperative, creative search for mutual gain where both could benefit. 
That's the key in negotiation. Thank you very much.